Welcome everyone um, to the session on structural racism, economic mobility, and well-being. Um, we're excited you all could join us today uh, for our last day of our grantee conference. Um, I think we've had some really um, engaging and um, fascinating sessions so far, and so I'm really excited to be moderating and sharing this one. Uh, we have some great presentations, and so um, yeah, we'll, we'll just jump right in. So my name is Stephen Brown, and I lead our work on economic mobility policy here at Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Um, and uh, we have four papers being presented today. Um, we're going to begin with a presentation on health, wealth, health, and structural racism and in Mesh Trio, um, presented by Keisha Bentley Edwards um, of Duke University. And that'll be followed by a presentation on not so black and white interracial marriage and labor market outcomes by Christina Houseworth. Um, uh, who is co-authoring with one of our Equiworth colleagues, Jonathan Fisher. Um, following that, we'll have a discussion um, uh, led by Marina Gorzig um, that'll last about 15 minutes. And then for the second half of our presentation, we'll move to another two papers, um, Supplementing Unemployment Insurance Records with Demographic Data by Jenny Romick and of, Washington, of the University of Washington. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll have the SNAP program and racial gaps in intergenerational transmission of poverty by Zach per Perlin of Columbia University. And then uh, following that, we'll have discussing remarks by James Ziliak of the University of Kentucky. We'll have about 10 minutes for each presentation and each discuss it. And you may hear me with interrupting remarks to keep time um, because not because anyone's was doing anything wrong, because sometimes it's just hard to see those Zoom reminders. So if I come on the screen and you know say, hey, can speed along a little bit, uh, just let me know. I'm just trying to make sure that everyone has the time allotted to them to do the presentation. Um, following all the presentations and discussions, we'll have an audience Q&A. And so we're really looking forward to the questions that you all um, in attendance will bring to these presenters, and I think it's going to be a really fascinating discussion. Ideally, at the end of this, we should have about 15, 20 minutes of, of Q&A if everything goes well and smoothly. One of the best things, um, and the Q&A is one of the best things about this grantee conference, right? We get to um, uh, have this discussion, get to have that direct interaction. We encourage you to use the Q&A box. Um, so if you have questions, just go ahead and put those in the Q&A box whenever they pop up. Um, if it is a really critically important clarifying question. I may uh, interrupt the presenter and ask that um, if it's really quick, but we are not gonna use much of the time to interrupt with questions we really wanna do. We really do wanna preserve those questions to the very end where we'll have our Q&A session. Um, and, and so this, I'm really excited about this line. I'm really excited about these presentations. Um, I work on, uh, my work is on, um, wealth and racial um, racial inequality. And so this is really uh, engaging and a fascinating session. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing what everyone has to say. And, you know, equitable growth is really invested in taking this academic research and, and making it uh, tangible and, and, and uh, accessible to policymakers who are going to be able to use this information to drive forward policy. And so our grantee conference is in intended to provide opportunities for our grantees to present and receive feedback on research and to engage in professional uh, development activities. We ask all participants to act with intellectual and professional integrity and allow for an environment where everyone can freely participate. We expect all participants to engage in civil and respectful discourse at all times. Um, and that's it for me. We really do want to preserve as much of this time as we can for um, the presenters. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Keisha Bentley Edwards. And you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, I am very happy to be here. Uh, let's see, I'm pretty sure I'm unmuted now. Um, yep, we can right, hear you. So, okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so today, uh, what I will be doing is talking about wealth, health, and structural racism. Oftentimes, uh, each of these are discussed individually, but this report that I'll be discussing today really talks about the interconnectedness of them. And so I'm at Duke University in the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity and also in the med school. Um, so the report, which is forthcoming, has a very uh, um, big and diverse research team, uh, particularly around our, um, our fields of interest and expertise. Uh, so obviously, if you're talking about the racial wealth gap and you don't have uh, Sandy Darity involved, are you really doing it? Uh, <laughs> just kidding, mostly. 
Um, but I wanted to make sure that I highlighted uh, who contributed um, and um, along with several research assistants and then um, a disclosure that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, was a major funder of this project. So uh, what we wanted to do with this report was to really understand um, how researchers and policymakers should really understand um, the way that wealth, health, and structural racism are all interconnected. And so you see in the graphic, you have these cogs that are all working together, but structural racism is bigger because it's the driving force for both health and wealth disparities, but they also impact each other. And so a key argument is that, uh, that we are making is that the racial wealth gap serves as a root cause of racial health disparities, particularly when we're looking at black, white Americans. Now, in, uh, in what I'm presenting today, I will focus on black, white health disparities, but also acknowledge that these racial disparities are not um, just on a racial binary. Um, and then also acknowledging that structural racism creates greater opportunities for exposure to diseases uh, instead of the maintenance. And so when we're talking about this, we have to think about this persistent generational wealth gaps that are a defining feature of racial inequality in the US and that wealth accumulation trans is transformative across households and generations. Uh, and so really thinking about this um, as far as the context. So when we're talking about these things, you have to understand the context and we encourage people to look at history, look at contemporary times so that you can understand what happened before to get us this place and what needs to happen next so that we can move forward. We uh, really discuss the, the racial wealth gap um, and, and a lot of it has to do with how wealth is um, held. So we often hear about the top 10% in the US, but really, um, try to, and oftentimes the conversations take race out of it. And a lot of it is this idea of looking at wealth and class as a distinct um, variable from race. And we argue that these uh, are, go together. And in this chart, you can see that even when we're talking about professional class versus working class, uh, the Black um, the white members of the white professional managerial class have a median net worth about three times as high um, as the white working class, so, which you would somewhat expect. But then when you also look at the median net worth um, of the white working class, you see that it's higher than the black professional class. So that's when you see these types of gaps in areas where you have um, racial, when, you, when you're talking about things that we look at as on a continuum as far as wealth and education, wealth and professional careers, you find when we start to disaggregate it by race that these numbers um, are not always um, as you would expect. And uh, to be clear, um, when we're talking about health, we're not talking about Black as a risk factor. We're talking about racism <laughs> as a risk factor. So I really want to emphasize, you hear a lot of people talking about the social construction of race. And, and really, we really do mean it, that the social construction of race supports racial hierarchies that are indicative of structural racism. So although we see... Uh, disparities along racial lines, those disparities represent an exchange between social constructs um, that influence both health and wealth outcomes. And so we're not talking about genetic causes. Uh, I'm in the med school, so I'm constantly having the conversation about we're not talking about race medicine. You can talk precision medicine is great, race medicine is not. So a lot of it has to do with how you are using your analytical models to evaluate uh, different racial experiences that lead to specific outcomes, which is appropriate, rather than using a biological aspect of race as the cause for outcomes, which is inappropriate. So a lot of what we wanted to know, and I'm due to time constraints, um, I won't go into each, um, so what you have to look forward to 
when the report does come out is we wanted to know uh, when it came to looking at this, uh, this, the, this interaction between race, wealth, and health, um, we wanted, what do we know? What's the existing research? What are the existing data sets? And I just wanted to acknowledge the roles that our different team members um, have played in these sections. And so here I'm going to um, expand um, also uh, on these, uh, the research and the policy uh, recommendations. Um, and to um, the NASC, uh, which is um, a data set that was created in collaboration uh, with the Cook Center, um, is a series of surveys administered uh, in six metropolitan areas and is actually growing uh, to several other over the next few years that replicates the rich modules and questions of assets and debts that we find in the PSA, PSID. But also there is um, health data as well, although it is still limited to self-rated care. Um, health, but we uh, but it does have really rich uh, racial and ethnic background information. So it's it's a really great and excellent resource. So thinking about what we know, um, what we know is that race and racism matters. When we uh, surveyed the research, that uh, to ex understand a class and isolation of race is really not possible. Um, and in that, money, education are not a race are not race neutral variables. And oftentimes, there's this goal of looking for race neutral variables. But the way that um, that if you want to understand race, you actually have to study race <laughs> um, and not use proxies. Um, the other aspect is that uh, common socio demographic variables. Uh, do not have a linear relationship for African Americans. So oftentimes we think about um, the more education you have, the better health outcomes uh, that occur. But we know that when it comes to uh, African American women with higher levels of education, so Black women with a bachelor's degree or higher have worse infant mortality outcomes than Black women, than white women uh, who have not graduated from high school. So there are things that we look at in the general population or even more specifically in a white population that doesn't line up. And we argue that this is an indicator where structural racism may be occurring. So when you see these, this mismatch or these non linear relationships of things that we look at as being the standard, that is a, um, it may, it, it, it should warrant um, further exploration for structural racism. Um, proxies uh, are typically used to capture structural racism, so we felt that we um, need better tools. Um, and we also um, are uh, we're aware, and you all know this as well, that proxies are often used to capture wealth. Uh, so instead of looking at assets and debt, uh, you'll find education, income, um, professional status, um, home ownership um, as that proxy. And that this other one, which was very key to me, is that self-health, self-rated health variables are often ambiguous. How would you rate your personal health, for example? Well, there are cultural, age, as well as wealth um, indicators that would influence how a respondent would answer those questions. So, um, you know, if I'm, are you basing my good health on whether or not I can run a marathon or, or if I can perform everyday activities? Uh, and then the national data sets, data sets tended to have uh, exceptional health or wealth variables. Now, there were um, uh, a few data sets that did have good quality measures for both health and wealth, and that's the PSID panel study of income dynamics, as well as ad health. Um, and the NASC uh, is one that has other assets, but it does need more robust health. Um, information. The uh, last, oh, and then also racial variables are often limited to white, non-white, or do not recognize ethnic diversity or multiracial um, background. And a lot of that has to do with the data collection strategies. So 
um, one of the um, big challenges that we had is that there weren't enough uh, representation of Black people or um, you know, Asian Americans, Native Americans, Latinos um, in the high wealth group to make true comparisons with their white counterparts because the disparities are, are so vast. Uh, what we need to know, uh, we need to know how these intersecting identities and demographic variables um, in our in, uh, inform health and wealth outcomes. We need better measures of health in larger data sets. We, these, are, these are things that are missing that we need to get better information so that we can really find the tie and better assessment tools of structural racism. Uh, we know that that interpersonal racism uh, has an, uh, an impact on health, but it's more difficult to look at how interpersonal health, structural racism all go together. Um, and when we're talking about interpersonal racism, you have to acknowledge that systems support um, these interpersonal experience or biases so that they can continue. And by doing this, we can point to policies that influence as well the racial wealth gap. <clears throat> Excuse me, Keisha, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, we're a couple minutes over time. And so um, if you could wrap up uh, quickly, absolutely. Um, that would be, be great. Um, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So overall, our recommendations uh, were that we need more robust intentional data collection strategies when it comes to both disaggregate the ability to disaggregate data, as well as um, on, on multiracial ethnic groups. Um, but we also need more robust health, wealth, uh, and racial variables in our large existing national data sets or create new ones. Um, and one thing that is very important is that we have to examine structural racism as a phenomenon that not only disadvantages specific groups, but also creates advantage for others. And on the policy sides that if you want it to, if you want to eliminate racial disparities, it does require uh, um, re uh, race uh, focus inequities. Like if you want to eliminate racial disparities, you actually have to focus on race. Um, other um, policy recommendations may be covered in some of the next um, presentations, but I wanted to make sure, make it clear that eliminating disparities in health and wealth, while also developing uh, ubiquitous positive outcomes, to be clear, we don't want other groups to have worse health outcomes and worse wealth outcomes. We want everyone to have positive outcomes, but it means that you have to fight structural racism. Acknowledge it in team and thank you and I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Um, and next we'll just uh, pass it over to Christina Houseworth. Um, floor is yours. Hello. Okay, hey, hello. Um, I am Christina Houseworth and I'm presenting joint work with Jonathan Fisher, Not So Black and White, Interracial Marriage and Wages. And the main motivation for this work has to do with labor market inequalities between white and black individuals in the US. And by incorporating marriage into the analysis, we're adding a measure of intimacy. And when you talk about interracial marriage, you're looking at interracial marriage or rates of interracial marriage, tell us something about racial boundaries in the US. And attitudes towards racial intermarriage also tell us something about racial social boundaries in the US. And these things affect labor market outcomes. So we use the 2008 to the 2019 American Community Survey. Um, we're looking at native born only, non-Hispanic black and white, alone, heterosexually married, married only once, born after 1965, at least 25 years old. And there's good reasons for all of these restrictions that are covered in our paper that I don't have time to go into now. Um, of our sample of the black individuals in our sample, about 17 and a half percent are intermarried. Among the white individuals, it's about 1.3%. 
a couple of notes before I go on because everybody's thinking about this as soon as I ever start talking um, about this. We're not claiming any causality. We're not saying that intermarriage causes larger or lower earnings. Um, we do use the terms premium and penalty, but mainly that's an efficiency thing. Um, the, the gap is either positive or negative. We're not we're not saying anything about causality. We do attempt to you know, investigate a couple potential avenues with regards to causality, and I will get to that in one minute. Um, the other comment I wanna make is that we would prefer to use longitudinal data. Um, intermarriage sample sizes are relatively small. And so using a data set like the NLSY or the PSID, it's it, we really cannot do much with it. Um, but future work, we have been approved for a project and we'll be able to link administrative data with the ACS data, which means we'll be able to observe characteristics before and after marriage. So that's our, we're going to get there. But right now we're just kind of trying to establish um, these patterns. So what do we think matters? Oops. Oh, I guess I'm going to show you the gap first. Sorry. Um, here I'm just showing you mean log wages. The important thing to take away from this picture is that the difference between intra and intermarried. Intermarried is when you're married outside of your racial group. The other important thing I want you to take note of is that when we're talking about the intermarriage differential, we're talking about it within group. So we're talking about, so for for white males, the intermarriage gap is, is a negative 12%. And that means that white men married to black women earn about 12% lower than white men married to white women. So these we're, we're talking about these things in terms of groups, right? So the intermarriage penalty is about 12% to white men. It's There's also a penalty to intermarriage for white women close to 6%. And then we find premiums for black men and women. For black men, it's about 4%. And for black women, it's about 8.4%. Um, so what do we think matters? Obviously, first of all, there might be some patterns among the characteristics that determine wages among intermarried and intermarried individuals. So there may be some things that explain these gaps just because of those patterns, right? So the things that we control for are year, of the survey, metropolitan status, veteran status, number of children, experience or age, part-time status, occupational prestige, and education. And we have reasons for all of those, why we think all of those determinants are important. Um, I don't have time to go over all of them at this moment. Um, we also think that selection into intermarriage might play an important role. There is a large literature on intermarriage and selection into intermarriage, and so that might have something to do with these wage gaps that we see. We also think that there is a possibility that there might be some sort of labor market discrimination against people who are interracially married. These are the things that we examine here. The other things that we no matter, but we don't have, we're not, we're not dealing with in this project, our network effects and human capital acquisition after marriage. So that's like a next, next, next step. So part one, patterns and wage determinants. We estimate the following equation. We use the coefficients on black intermarried and then an interaction between black and intermarried to estimate our wage, our predicted wage gaps include a vector of those characteristics that I just went over, state fixed effects and year fixed effects. And when we do that, we find that some stuff happens. So in columns one and three, those are just the gaps that you saw before in the previous table. Um, the columns two and four show you, um, show you what happens after we control for all those characteristics. And so the first thing that I wanna point out is that um, for females, both black and white, the gaps essentially disappear. So the female gap of negative 6% goes to less than 1% and it's no longer statistically significant. Same thing happens for black females. For black men, the gap decreases by about 1% and the gap for white men decreases um, by about two percentage points, but it's still large at um, 10%. So next thing that we look at is potential selection into intermarriage. Um, I do not have any time to go over these, but there are two theories in the, in the marriage literature, own race preferences and status exchange. They, for 
white individuals, both theories predict that intermarried individuals will have lower earnings. For black individuals, the two theories predict opposite. They have opposite predictions for intermarried individuals. That is important, but it's not important for right now. So we're just going to kind of skip over that. And the thing that is important for right now is that if there is selection into intermarriage, these gaps and these things are going to be present at the beginning of the marriage and not necessarily change so much over time. So what do we do? Um, we estimate that first equation again, except we take out all of those initial variables that we use to estimate the wage gap, black intermarried, and then black interacted with intermarried. And then we plot the residuals by those categories, by sex, race, and intermarriage status. And then we also plot them by years married. When we do that, there's no pattern for women, white or black. So I'm not showing you those pictures. When we do that for black men, we see that individuals who have who just got married, the gap between intermarried and intermarried is essentially non-existent. And the gap that we see is really among those who have been married um, for longer, for a longer period of time, which for me suggests that there's some network effects potentially going on. Um, or some human capital acquisition after marriage, but it's not indicative of selection into intermarriage for black men, which is contrary to what most of the intermarriage literature finds when you look at this conditional on education. Um, when we look at white males, we see that the gap is there from the very beginning. And um, we see that the gap is there from the very beginning and it kind of persists over time, which is enough evidence for me to say that I think there is some selection into intermarriage for white men. Um, last thing we do is we um, try to examine a potential causal pathway through discrimination. Um, we're not providing that mechanism for how it works, but here's some ideas of how it might work. You know, you, you get a job, they don't know that you're intermarried. Over time, that may be, may be disclosed. If it is disclosed and employers are biased in some way, it, it may be unconscious it, or it may be a conscious choice by the employer, whatever the case. It may be that they provide fewer raises, promote you less, you're more likely to be laid off. There could be, and I think there is, likely an occupational crowding story going on here. Um, so, but that's just what we think could be happening. We're not really measuring that part of it. We're saying, if this exists, how could we potentially see that it exists? And so we use a proxy for discrimination. Um, we use the 1967 Loving versus Virginia decision that ruled anti-miscegenation laws unconstitutional. Um, prior to 1967, there were still 16 states that had laws that made interracial marriage illegal. Prior to that, there were also states who had these laws that they overturned on their own. Um, so Initially, we did an analysis where we, and it's in the paper, where we, we just look at in a loving state versus not a loving state. So in a state that was forced to repeal versus states that were not forced to repeal. And then we also do this analysis where we look at three states of being um, one, live, you live in a state that never had anti-miscegenation laws. Two, you live in a state that repealed those laws before loving. And three, you were forced to repeal. So we add those um, interactions into equation one. And then we estimate, again, the predicted wage gaps. And here is the very last thing I'm going to show you. We are looking at the intermarriage premium or penalty and separating by male, female, and then by these um, loving conditions. So if you look at white men who lived in a state that never had the law, the gap is about negative 7%. Compared to those that repealed on their own or were forced to repeal, it's close to 11%. When you look at white women, there is only a 1% gap, not statistically significant, in the states that never had the laws or that were forced to repeal, although there is a negative 5% gap in states that were forced to repeal. And this is, these gaps are estimated conditional controlling for all those variables I talked about at the very beginning, which is interesting because the gap was eliminated once we included them for women. Um, if we look for black men, there are positive premiums in states that never had the laws and states that were that repealed on their own. And there is no premium in states that were forced to repeal.
Um, we see similar story for black women in states that never had these laws. There is a premium of 9%, right? And then no statistically significant premium or penalty in states that repealed on their own or were forced to repeal. So concluding really quickly, gaps for women disappear with measurable characteristics. There's evidence of negative selection into intermarriage for white men. And then we do think that there's evidence of discrimination when we parse this data by loving state. And what's really interesting to me is that those black and white premiums and penalties pop back up even when we have um, the controls. Thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, and we're going to pass it over to uh, Marina, who will have 15 minutes to discuss these two papers. Um, hello, um, I'm Marina uh, Melio Borzik from Mathematica, and I just had, um, these were amazing papers, I had an amazing time reading them, um, and I'm happy to uh, be able to talk about them here. Um, excellent. So uh, both of these papers really were kind of asking big questions about social barriers, um, about structural racism, and I think that uh, they, they work together really well in the sense that they're both really kind of zooming out and asking, asking these bigger picture questions. Um, some of the other commonalities that I saw between them, um, both papers were um, really dealing with an imperfect data situation, right? Uh, for the first paper, we see that there isn't uh, great data always on health and wealth in the same data set. Um, and in the second paper, we see that, yes, like longitudinal data um, would, would really benefit kind of this type of analysis. And I think uh, both sets of authors really did a great job of highlighting the data gaps and also using what they do have to um, still answer these really important questions. Um, and then both papers are really kind of opening the door, I think, and, and highlighting important future work, both in terms of data policy and, um, and future research paths. Uh, so digging in a little bit more into the first paper, this is uh, really an amazing comprehensive report on health and wealth. And this, uh, the presentation was really just kind of scratching the surface of this, of this really, um, really tremendous work with many different collaborators on here on a, on a bunch of different topics. I'm very excited to see this, this actually come out, the final product. Um, and a really, uh, again, just highlighting the data here, a really strong argument for needing more fine-grained data that has really good data on health and wealth together because these, these concepts are so closely tied together and right now the data is just really limiting um, um, a researcher's ability to kind of dig into these mechanisms here a little bit more. Uh, the particular uh, section uh, that we learned about here today uh, kind of really emphasizing um, kind of like what are researchers actually measuring when we have self-reported health what what is that really saying how is this how is this what kind of concept is this capturing what types of race and ethnicity variables um, are, are we have do we have and how are we really making comparisons um, that make sense and definitely highlighting this concern that income and socioeconomic status have different relationship to health and wealth among black americans compared to white americans so if, we're, um, if we have policies or if we have research questions that are solely cutting based on income or SES, that's missing this whole huge component here about wealth. Um, and uh, the role of this aggregated data, a really great um, um, example in, in this section was about very few white Americans uh, don't go to the doctor uh, for fear of discrimination. And the small number that do almost all are LGBT. Um, and so kind of really needing to have finer grain data on exactly what barriers are facing people based on, on different identities and intersectional identities. Um, one of the quotes that I thought just, I wanted to really highlight here and uh, throw this to um, audience members and, and the authors to, to discuss a little bit more is we cannot emphasize enough that if researchers and policymakers truly want to eliminate racial disparities, then initiatives must address race and racism directly. 
This is really moving on kind of from this rising tide approach where a rising tide lifts all boats, but it keeps those gaps stable. Um, and I think some of the questions here that um, I thought I'd be really interested to hear from the authors as well as audience is how do we make this approach uh, more politically feasible? Um, sometimes trying to address uh, race and racism directly uh, takes longer um, and is harder to get um, through the political process. So how do we make this more politically feasible? Um, and then kind of some of the pros and cons of using race correlates. We have seen recently, for example, um, uh, using Pell Grant, uh, be, uh, having received a Pell Grant to kind of target student loan forgiveness, um, zip code and vaccine rollouts with COVID, um, Derek Hamilton's um, proposals sometimes on baby bonds have been explicitly race neutral and tying that to uh, wealth versus race. And um, sometimes these are more expedient or politically feasible. And so what are the pros and cons kind of of using, of using those approaches? Um, okay. So moving on to uh, the second paper, uh, this was a really impressive paper that delved into like, a really complex, important question that has a lot of moving parts here. Um, they find a wage premium for black men in interracial marriage, a wage penalty for white men in interracial marriage, kind of a weaker and null results for black and white women once, once they control for other factors. Um, there's a lot of factors happening and the paper um, kind of highlights selection versus discrimination. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, I think there might be some more things going on here as well um, that they might be able to look at. Um, okay, so uh, kind of a, came out a little blurry, just tried to screen grab this from the paper. Um, one thing I was curious about is when we're, when you're looking at um, kind of the years married um, and then these residual plots, um, I think kind of this comparison at year zero is really interesting. Probably like, is there selection into marriage? We don't see a gap for the, between black intermarried or intermarried uh, men, but you do for white. Thinking about it as we move along that x-axis, I was curious about other forms of selection as you're moving along that x-axis, because people are gonna be leaving this line, right? Uh, you or your spouse could die, um, or you could get divorced. And so there might be people on these lines leaving, and they might be leaving differently. And so I was curious about how comparable are people kind of on the right, side of that x-axis to the left side of that x-axis. And can we really think about this as over time or are there other types of selection um, that could be happening in terms of who is leaving, who is leaving these lines? I was also very curious, um, the graphs for women, um, black intermarried women and white intramarried women have this very curious kind of shape of where uh, the, the residual wages kind of rise and then fall, which was quite different than um, any of the other lines or any of the other groups. Um, and then I was thinking about this and I was like, you know, black intermarried women and white intermarried women are both married to white men um, who make more than anybody else. Um, and so that started me thinking on her more intra-household dynamics here of your labor force decisions are going to be influenced by your spouses. Um, so, I would, I would push the authors to think a little bit more about what's happening within the family, um, within, within the couple in terms of people who are married to very high earning people um, might be making different labor market decisions. And I was struck by the similar residual pattern um, for these two groups and they're both married to white men. Um, I thought that the loving comparison was super interesting. Um, I do think that uh, this is just a, uh, from Wikipedia here, grabbed the, uh, the what states are kind of being compared here. Uh, was it overturned in 1967? Was it repealed or did they never have this law passed? Um, and so I was curious kind of about, I don't know, I was curious about this comparison of like, is it just the South versus not the South? Um, would it be possible to compare rural urban within the same state, for example? Because I was thinking uh, if you're an interracial couple in rural Wisconsin versus Atlanta, Georgia, um, where are you actually gonna experience less discrimination? Um, um, I, would, I would assume rural Wisconsin, but that would be in, in the repealed group here. So um, 
I was curious about if there's more ways to get at kind of levels of bias or levels of discrimination, possibly using GSS um, or, or other measures of, of um, kind of animosity or bias um, to kind of really kind of dig into that discrimination question. Because um, otherwise it felt like it was a little bit just a regional comparison, which is also interesting, but um, yeah. Awesome. So overall, I thought these were absolutely fantastic papers. Greatly enjoyed reading them. And um, I hope that my comments can spur uh, some discussion uh, with the audience and among the authors. Um, and thank you so much for sharing them. Thank you, Marina, for that uh, really fascinating discussion and for putting out um, some really interesting questions. Hopefully we have uh, time at the end for the authors to respond to some of the questions that you raised, but um, in the interest of time, we're gonna keep it moving. And so I think next we're gonna turn to uh, Jenny Romick uh, to, for her presentation. So Jenny, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see if I can manage to show my slides on this floor. Um, Thank you um, to all for your patience here. Um, let me start my timer so I uh, try to stay more or less within our bounds here. Um, this is joint work with a lot of people, but most proximately um, Lizzie Pelletier, um, a fabulous doctoral student here who will be looking for a job um, in the next few years, um, but is currently taking a well-deserved vacation. Um, so, and I'd like to also um, thank Stephen for today's session and more broadly thank the Center for Equitable Growth that has funded some of this work along the way. Um, the way I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how this work fits into the theme of the panel today, um, structural racism, economic mobility, and well-being. What I'm talking about is, is really a building block for doing research on this topic. Um, I'm going to be talking about adding demographic information to state unemployment insurance records, state UI records, um, and in part, the important contribution of this work, I think, is in providing data that can address some of the limitations that Keisha and Christina and Marina all discussed in terms of existing longitudinal data sets where, where you look, you want to look at dynamics over time, you want to look at those dynamics by race, by ethnicity, by age, by gender, all of these are, are factors um, that show up in the labor market outcomes, whether it's through um, job level or, or industry level discrimination, or whether it's through larger structural impacts of racism, um, sexism, other, other dimensions there. So this is really a building block. Um, I have 10 minutes to talk about um, what's been, I think, eight years and counting of putting together a super complex data set. So um, I hope to leave you with a little sense of what this is and maybe the inspiration um, to look at my website or email me to, to ask for a copy of this paper. So um, this work started um, back in 2014 when the city of Seattle passed our $15 minimum wage bill. I was part of a large um, group of, of colleagues here at the University of Washington who worked with the city to understand the impacts of that. Um, because it was a city level a local um, policy change, we couldn't rely on really any national survey data. So we turned to state unemployment insurance records um, and our my labor economist colleagues um, put out some work just looking at standard labor market outcomes, employment, um, 
earnings over time. But there are also a lot of questions about the minimum wage impacts that can't be answered with UI records um, because we don't know the characteristics of the workers other than their work history as it shows up in UI. We don't know race. We don't know gender. We don't know ethnicity. We don't know age. Um, we also don't know household status. I'm a poverty researcher and Poverty is a household construct, so I really wanted to know who was coupled with whom and who was supporting kids. Um, so that's how it started. Um, I knew Washington had a history of doing some great merged administrative data, um, and so we developed this plan to um, augment UI records with other um, records across the state. And we partnered with our a group at our um, Department of Social and Health Services, the SHS, who already does this for a bunch of their clients um, over time. So we had the vision. And I will admit that my vision here of putting together administrative data was a little naive. I was kind of going off the crime shows where you have somebody who types for about 15 minutes and then says, oh, I have found your licensed plumber who drives a white econoline and has B negative blood and he must be the suspect. Uh, the reality is much longer. Um, and so I, the, the Pacific Northwest analogy I use on this is we had trail blowdowns, you know, we had stuff we had to climb over on our, on our preferred hike here. Um, but eventually we got data put together um, that we call internally at UW, the Washington Merged Longitudinal Administrative Data set or WIMLAD. Um, it's data that contains records from six different state agencies and a couple of sub-administrations within those. It's linked with a unique person identifier across all those sources. It's longitudinal. Everything I'm talking about here today covers 2010 through 2016, and we have some extensions in the works. Um, and although we got de-identified data, we don't have names, uh, we do have residential address location to the census block. So um, here are the different sources that we have in here. Um, and together, you'll see that we're really able to create um, a pretty robust census level kind of full population count of um, working age adults in Washington. So we have workers from um, the employment security data that administers UI. We have people who participate in public means tested or publicly funded social service programs from DSHS and the healthcare authority, including Medicaid, SNAP, TANF, um, juvenile rehab, a, a number of other programs there. Uh, we have birth certificate records from the Department of Health, voter records from the Secretary of State, um, licensing records from the Department of Licensing, and the voter and DOL licensing records are, to my knowledge, pretty unique among people who do integrated data work. Um, we also have some arrest records from State Patrol, um, but don't actually know much about those. We haven't used them much yet. Um, but essentially, if you worked in Washington, if you took part in means-tested programs, if you were registered to vote, if you were licensed to drive or had a state ID, or if you gave birth, we have you in this data. Um, and then we're working to make this a useful population data set. So um, the work I'll talk about today is how we assigned individual demographics. Um, we've also done residential histories and we're working on household construction. So I'm happy to talk more about those as well. Um, let's see. Okay, so our first step to getting demographic data was gathering it from the different sources. Um, here you see which sources had which um, demographic data available. Um, we compiled, we reconciled among, kind of created a hierarchy of trustworthiness among the different sources. Um, for some of our population, we have self-reported race and ethnicity data. For others, we use the um, Bayesian imputed BIS statistical and geographical um, BISG imputation. Um, I, I can never remember what that stands for. Um, anyhow, so as a result, when we look at the UI covered population, we're able to assign individual 
level demographics for about um, a little over 80% of workers in, um, in the state. We then compared this to American Community Survey estimates as a way of benchmarking and seeing how good our records are. Um, we, we don't necessarily think either one of these um, is, is the perfect ground truth here. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages, um, but the, the big picture um, is that, that we actually see a lot of a very reassuring overlap between the two sources. So this uses um, the ACS from 2013 and records from 2013 in our WIMLAD data. This is the midpoint of our observations. Um, here's the age profile. The gray bars are the ACS data and the green bars are our WIMLAD. Um, we tried to create a similar definition across the two. For instance, we use people who um, were employed by an employer in ACS. We took out people who were self-employed or who were contract workers who wouldn't show up in UI records. So our, our age profile looks um, very similar. Um, our race and ethnicity profile also looks fairly similar. 70% um, of Washingtonians, working age Washingtonians um, are white. So this graph is far less interesting if you in include them. Um, but here you can see um, we're within a half percent or so um, in terms of the other racial and ethnic groups. Um, one thing I'm particularly proud of WIMLAD data for, um, and I think it, it's a real contribution is we're able to identify Native American, American Indian, Alaska Native populations um, and Asian Pacific Islander, um, Native Hawaiian um, populations, Pacifica people um, in ways that, that um, I think are, are helpful because these groups are often not well captured in, in national survey data. So I, I see that as one of our important contributions. Um, when you compare WIMLAT earnings, um, you see some of the relative advantages and disadvantages of survey versus census data. Uh, interestingly, we find about 100,000 more very low earners um, than the ACS does. And I think this is, is just due to um, some sampling and response. It's due to um, some recall issues in responding to a survey. Um, but it for folks who are interested in, in thinking about um, um, marginal attachment to the labor force, I think it's a pretty interesting uh, source of data. So um, we are using this data to, um, to look at questions related to the Seattle minimum wage. Um, I have some new work going, looking at how younger and less experienced workers um, fared as well as workers of color. Um, we've also used this to look at how um, families um, and, and um, particularly parents who give birth might be affected by the medical leave. Um, I have another student who's thinking about um, older adults in the labor force. So um, overall, we're, we're um, developing this data both to answer our questions and also to think about other uses it could have. So. Um, I have a, we have a website here, um, so if folks are interested, you can visit that or email me to learn more about it. So thanks so much. I will stop sharing. All right, thank you for that. <clears throat> that was super interesting. Uh, and the BISG, the Bayesian Improved Surname Geocoding, which <laughs> I, I used um, for some imputation work in a former role, so um, I'm really excited to, to see it be put to use here and for some really strong imputation results. So um, bravo for all data collection, but the, um, um, the imputation, yeah, it seems like some really fascinating, really interesting data. So it, cool. I personally am very excited to see. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Day. Steve and I always want you to follow me and, and tidy up the... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and finally, um, for the presenters, uh, we have uh, Zach. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Great. Thanks a lot to Stephen and the entire uh, Equitable Growth team. 
I'm Zach Perl, and I'm at uh, Bocconi University here in Milan, which explains why it's a little bit darker in my rooms compared to others. And this is a joint work with uh, my Columbia colleagues, Ben Glasner, Ron Mincy, and Chris Weimer. And the focus of our work is, I'll say it's preliminary work, but we're interested in the effects of the earned income tax credit on racial differences in the intergenerational persistence of poverty. I'm gonna fly through some of the background as I think everyone here is familiar with the facts that I'll share. But to start, we know that there are large and rather persistent differences, racial differences in poverty rates, particularly among children. Black children are several times more likely than white children to, to live in poverty. And exposure to childhood poverty has long lasting consequences for education, health, employment, and poverty in adulthood as well, which is the primary focus of this paper. We know that income support policies like SNAP or the Earned Income Tax Credit can reduce not only poverty rates, but racial differences in poverty as well in the short run. And there's also a rather large literature now on some of the long-term benefits of policy interventions, income support policies, benefits ranging from favorable health, economic, uh, social conditions, uh, and, and more. We argue in the paper that there's a little bit less understanding of how and the extent to which these income support policies might affect longer run racial disparities in poverty rates, and also the intergenerational persistence of poverty or that relationship of childhood poverty and poverty in young adulthood. The specific policy that we're gonna focus on in, in this paper is the earned income tax credit. And I don't think I need to explain in too much detail to this group, but just a, a few basics. The earned income tax credit is work conditional and is provided upon filing taxes. It was introduced in 1975, but it's been expanded a couple times around 1994 and 2010, particularly with families and more children. Many states now have their own state supplements to the federal earned income tax credit. And there's past work that shows that the introduction and expansion of the EITC has had favorable effects on educational attainment, employment outcomes, and, and more. And so with that background in mind, our paper is really trying to get at these three questions that you see on the screen. To what extent does the introduction and expansion of the EITC affect the intergenerational persistence of poverty, number one? Number two, how does it vary by race and by gender? And number three, through which mechanisms might the EITC operate in shaping poverty outcomes in later life? The data we're going to use to answer these questions is the PSID or the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. We use some modifications from the CNF files to get a more comprehensive measure of income in there. And our final sample is around 5,000 respondents. And this is because we limit our sample to individuals who we can observe basically throughout their entire childhood and also their young adulthood in the PSID. So all of our respondents are eventually observed once in our final sample around age 35, or their closest observation to age 35, at least age 25. So 25 to 35 year olds, who we can also see during their childhood in the PSID. Our poverty variable, we're primarily going to use a pre-tax, pre-transfer measure of poverty. I'll explain why later. It's mostly to make sure that the direct influence of the EITC doesn't affect some of our measures that we're interested in. We're using OPM poverty thresholds or the official poverty measure poverty thresholds for convenience given the PSID and what we can work with in there. And we have two major outcomes that we're interested in. First is exposure to poverty during childhood. So capturing the mean pre-tax transfer income, right, poverty from zero to 17. And we'll look at how that's related to poverty in adulthood, looking at the mean pre-tax transfer poverty rate, again, around age 25 to 35. And we're interested in how the EITC has affected that relationship between childhood poverty and adult poverty. So we're going to follow some work from Jacob Bastian and Kathy Nicklemore and measure the cumulative, cumulative EITC exposure during childhood, which is really just taking into account variation in treatment intensity of the EITC that's due to federal and state policy changes. So the variation based on when the child was born in which state the child grew up, given that states have their own EITC supplements, and family structure, because benefits depend on whether there's one, two, or three or more children in the home. And we're gonna measure that total EITC exposure at eight, throughout the entire childhood and measure the sum at age 18, 
And this is measured independently of actual EITC benefit received. It's important to note too, that we're capturing the potential exposure to avoid any endogeneity concerns about actual receipt and the outcomes we look at. Our model, we're gonna start with a relatively simple OLS estimate of the effect of that EITC exposure on the intergenerational persistence of poverty. So our outcome that we're interested in is poverty in young adulthood. We're gonna look at that child poverty, beta one variable is that exposure to childhood poverty that I told you about. Beta two is that cumulative EITC exposure. And we're really interested in beta three, which is telling us does greater exposure to, to more EITC benefits particularly reduce the likelihood of young adult poverty for adults who spent more of their ch childhoods in poverty. We'll capture birth year effects, age and year effects, state fixed effects and more, and we'll mostly split our models by race and gender. So to get to some findings in my final uh, five minutes here, this is just descriptive information looking at how, the how childhood poverty is associated with poverty in young adulthood. So on the y-axis is poverty in young adulthood around age 35. On the x-axis is the three different groups that we're looking at. Adults who had no experience of childhood poverty on the left side, adults with a little bit of exposure to childhood poverty in the middle, and adults with high exposure to child poverty on the right side. And there's two takeaways from this graph that I wanna highlight. The first, as we all know, more exposure to childhood poverty is associated with more poverty in adulthood. That's why the, the y-axis you see these rates growing as we go from left to right here. But at each level of exposure to childhood poverty, black adults are still more likely than comparable white adults to be in poverty. So if you look at the no child poverty group on the left side, for example, you see that black adults face a poverty rate in their adulthood of 13% if they experience no childhood poverty. But for, but for similar white adults, that rate's only 5%. And you see these disparities exist at every step along the way. So to get to our first two research questions, what I'm gonna do is show you just some regression results first, and then I'll visualize the magnitude of these effects here in, in a couple slides after. But what we're asking first is, does greater exposure to the EITC affect poverty in young adulthood? And these results are split for men and women here. And the first finding I wanna highlight is that greater EITC exposure during childhood is associated with a, stint, with a decreased likelihood of poverty in adulthood for white men, white men given this interaction term right here. And the second finding is that the poverty reduction effect is even stronger for black men. A one standard deviation increase in EITC exposure is associated with a seven percentage point decline in the likelihood of being in poverty in adulthood for black men. And we see pretty similar patterns for uh, white women. We can, that's looking at differences by race, but we can also just look at how the EITC effect differs depending on how much of childhood was spent in poverty. And the finding I want to highlight here is that among all men, greater EITC exposure during childhood reduces that intergenerational persistence of poverty, our results suggest, or that relationship of childhood poverty to young adult poverty. We don't see similar effects for women, which is interesting, and we can come back to this and to understand this triple interaction, which is going to uh, turn to these figures here in my mind, a final uh, minute or so. What we're looking at here is the predicted likelihood of poverty by race and by exposure to the ITC and by exposure to childhood poverty. So what I'm going to do on the, the y-axis is the predicted likelihood of poverty in young adulthood. And on the x-axis are several different groups. And the three lines for each group are showing the difference in the predicted poverty rate when going from EITC exposure that's one standard deviation below the mean to the mean to one standard deviation above the mean. And there's a couple of facts I wanna highlight here rather quickly. The first is that greater EITC exposure is associated with a lower predicted likelihood of poverty in young adulthood for black and white adults alike. You see going from one standard deviation below to above the mean is associated with the decline in the likelihood of poverty from 21% to 13% for black adults here. Interestingly, these effects are really weak and not significant for black adults with no exposure to childhood poverty. Instead, they're concentrated here in this group, uh, black adults with high exposure to childhood poverty. And you see strong declines in the predicted poverty rate for black adults with high exposure to childhood poverty when the EITC generosity uh, increases, uh, rather strong decrease there going from one standard deviation below to above the mean. 
Now, I don't have time to talk about the, the mechanisms in detail, but I just want to walk through three simple findings. Uh, the first, you can ignore the table on the screen. This is just telling you that the EITC increased household incomes for all families, but especially for uh, black, fam black families with children when they were growing up. So greater exposure to the EITC boosted post-tax transfer incomes for black families in particular. And then we find that this channels into higher likelihood of achieving a high school degree. Some evidence that it might channels into more college attendance, higher employment rates for black and white adults with higher exposure to childhood poverty. And the EIDC is also channeling itself into higher hours worked per week. That's a very fast look at mechanisms, but I'll wrap up here just to summarize what our preliminary findings suggest. That the introduction and expansion of the EITC appears to have led to long run declines in poverty rates. The poverty reducing effects are particularly strong for black men who face more exposure to childhood poverty. And our early results suggest that they're channeled primarily through higher post-tax transfer incomes during childhood and also more high school degree completion, employment and hours worked. And I'll close with this slide. This is early work. We have a lot more to do in terms of methodology, understanding mechanisms and measurement. And we just really welcome your feedback on how we can improve this paper going forward. Thank you. Um, I think we've all been really lucky to have four fascinating papers and presentations. So um, really interesting stuff. And um, uh, final um, discussion goes to, to James. Um, we'll discuss the last two papers and uh, you have the floor and you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, it was a delight to read these two papers. Uh, hello to Jenny and to Zach. Uh, uh, too bad we can't be in person, but uh, at least I get to see you virtually. Uh, I'll take what I can get. So uh, I'm gonna just uh, discuss these papers in order. Um, and first of all, the, the paper that Jenny presented, um, it's really important research agenda. The, the UW team has been really pathbreaking in their work over the last near decade working on trying to understand the local impact of the minimum wages in the uh, Seattle area. And this agenda to take uh, this UI data and link it to other admin records and the survey data is ambitious. And as you know, you could kind of gather from Jenny, it's this eight year, eight year love affair so far and, and, and going on. So, you know, the important thing that, you know, she highlighted that you're going to pick up is that um, you know, important variables are usually missing from our administrative records, uh, uh, in particular race and education are, are uh, important demographics missing. You can oftentimes pick up, say, if you got access to IRS tax data, you might, you can pick up marital status and, and age and, uh, uh, and gender, but uh, uh, generally you are missing for both race and education. So this is great. The other advantage is that it will be able to link to long time series on individuals. So you'll be able to do uh, uh, longitudinal uh, panel data studies of uh, both transitions in and out of the labor market, but ultimately by linking it to some of the transfer programs, uh, uh, movements in and out of the transfer programs or co-movements of combining work and various forms of social assistance. Uh, I've been uh, a longtime fan and jealous of UI uh, at, of Washington's uh, um, uh, brilliance and actually recording hours of work in their UI records data. It's pretty rare, uh, which is somewhat baffling. Uh, I think it's what is it, gen six, six states or something like that, that that collect hours data along with the earnings. Uh, as a labor economist, of course, I love to know what people's wages are, which you can do when you have both access to earnings and hours. Um, I will say this is complementary to federal efforts at the Census Bureau, where they're linking uh, data from Social Security and the IRS tax records, as well as some uh, participating state transfer programs to data sets like the March CPS or the American Community Survey or the decennial census. And so there is some effort to, to do uh, similar types of analyses at various levels uh, using federal data. Um, uh, but as those of you on this call know, uh, 
that access to access to that data is very restricted. Um, so uh, I will highlight, you know, a couple of, of findings that that uh, Jenny and Elizabeth highlight. So they find that UI records have more workers with earnings less than ten thousand dollars compared to the American Community Survey. And I'll just highlight that that is consistent with administrative records in general, both the uh, LEHD as well as the detailed earnings records uh, from uh, SSA. And this is often ascribed to the fact that survey respondents will oftentimes underreport short employment spells, which is, you know, kind of fascinating uh, uh, to 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 you know get your head around because uh, another reason you know what what you may find in, in in admin data is between admin and survey data is differential reporting. So. Uh, respondents may report earnings uh, to the survey, but may not report it uh, uh, to the tax authority. So in other words, you know, underground work. So some work that I did with colleagues, uh, Chris Ballinger, Barry Hirsch, and Charles O'Camp used linked CPS data to the Social Security during, uh, detailed earnings file and find that conditional and covariates, actually earnings reports are higher in the survey data than, than admin data. So. Uh, those of you who are in the social welfare world hear a lot of stuff about uh, research by Bruce Meyer, Jim Sullivan, Nicholas Mittag about underreporting of transfers in survey data. Well, it turns out that there tends to be, uh, um, you know, I don't want to say overreporting of earnings relative to admin records. So admin records are not necessarily a panacea. So this is a non-parametric regression of, uh, or semi-parametric regression of ASEC earnings uh, uh, residuals on detailed earnings uh, 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 residuals. And if, and if they were you know, conditional on covariates the same, you'd be at that 45 degree line. And what you can see from this picture for both men and women that uh, on the left tail of the distribution, uh, the uh, survey data tends to be higher than the admin records. And on the right tail, uh, it's, it's the opposite. So, you know, is this a regression in the mean phenomenon we're picking up? You know, it's hard, hard to know uh, without further uh, research and most likely probably qualitative work. Um, they also highlight in the paper some challenges dealing with borders. So on the south, uh, southern border, you have to deal with the Portrin metropolitan area. And on the eastern uh, border, you have to deal with Spokane and Coeur d'Alene. Uh, which can create some some challenges in trying to figure out in the survey versus the admin records uh, what to do with border counties. And so, you know, as one test, you know, you could just throw border counties out and see what happens, right? Just to, as a robustness check. Um, the other way you could do it, and this is old work that I did with uh, uh, Chris Ballinger and Ken Trosky, where we we're focusing on Appalachia and then the ACS, you just have Puma. And so you don't actually have the hard Appalachian regional county identifiers. And so we use the census summary file and we weighted the share of the population that was within the Appalachian County versus not. And I think you can get information on commuting in the ACS. So you might be able to figure out who's commuting across the state versus not. Um, and, and so it's possible to maybe do some reweighting based on that. Uh, I'm not saying that's easy or fun, and it may, and it likely won't matter. It didn't matter for our work, uh, but but if you're really worried about it, something to think about. Um, all I guess my final comment is that you know we still have the challenge of a lot of uh, missing race, um, uh, even after that her Herculean effort that that you performed, and so it kind of begs the question of you know is there is there a future of trying to get these UI records, uh, your data set that you're putting it together and actually link it to the decennial census file, right? Obviously you are you have access to an RDC there, but I know that the state has its own rules and the feds have its own rules and you know, never the two shall marry, but hopefully we'll be in a world where they too, they, they will marry. And if you have access to the decennial, I think you can make a lot of that missing rates, race stuff go away. Um, so hopefully someday that might happen. So I better push on to Zach's paper. Great, really uh, appreciate all your work you're doing there, Jenny. Um, 
So Zach's paper is uh, looking at the EITC on racial differences on intergenerational persistence of poverty. This is a really interesting and important uh, piece of research. And actually the, the second bullet point should be first, right? There's been a lot of work on intergenerational income mobility, but a lot less work on poverty, uh, transmission of poverty across generations in general. Um, it's focusing more on, on mobility, oftentimes looking at different points of the distribution, but not poverty per se. And in particular, there's been less work on race. And, you know, there is some uh, uh, related literature is that I'll point Zach and his uh, co-author is out to. Yeah, there is some older work by uh, uh, Mark Rake and Tom Herschel looking at a life course, like, you know, how, using the PSID, how many years were you in poverty growing up? And, uh, and they look at by race. Um, they've also done some work on the food stamp program. So I highlight that. Uh, there's work by Ann Huff Stevens on multiple poverty spells that I encourage you to take a look at. And shout out to Bradley Hardy and Charles O'Cam and some joint work that we've recently done in the National Tax Journal looking at the EITC and black white income inequality. None of that, that's not intergenerational stuff. Um, I will actually give a shout out to Zach. Zach's colleague there at Columbia, Rob Hartley and, and uh, Carlos Lamarsh here at Kentucky in a recent work that we've done looking at welfare reform and the intergenerational transmission of welfare. So we're using the PSID to look at uh, transmission of welfare exposure in childhood uh, 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 on uh, adult take up of welfare and then leveraging the, the uh, welfare reforms of the 90s to do kind of a diff and diff type of structure similar to what Zach and his co-authors are doing it. To the best of my knowledge, you know, there's been very little work on this kind of on this type of work. And so I applaud them for pushing it to the broader uh, issue of poverty. Um, so uh, putting on my economist hat on and for perhaps my bias, uh, given uh, my recent work in this area, I do think the paper would be uh, helped out a little bit um, to uh, provide a little bit more structure a la Becker Tomes uh, model of uh, human capital investment, talk about you know parental decisions, how exposure to the EITC may affect the parents' decisions, both on their own choices as well as their, their children's choices. Um, the advantage of, of that framework is it really kind of naturally leads out to the regression framework that they ultimately adopt in their paper. Uh, and then you can talk about how you expand on the Becker Tomes structure to uh, use that policy variation in a diff and diff type of uh, setting. I will highlight, and this is an important issue brought up in the income mobility literature is an AER paper by Steve Heider and Gary Solon called Life Cycle Age Bias. And the issue is that, you know, you're gonna observe children uh, whose parents are gonna be of varying ages and oftentimes older compared to the where you're going to be measuring the children as, a, as an adult. You're going to be focusing on young adults, children who become young adults, and the kids' parents were older. And so you actually have to do some adjustments. And so there are some nice suggestions by Heider and Solon to adjust for the age differences across generations when you're using that data. Um, the authors are going to use statutory cumulative exposure to the EITC benefits during childhood as opposed to actual EITC receipt on the grounds that it avoids endogeneity. And I generally buy into that story, but it does, uh, it does hinge on the assumption that that EITC and changing generosity EITC over time based on the number of kids, it has to assume, you know, assume that there's uh, uh, no endogenous response on family structure uh, both, you know, marriage or not, as well as uh, fertility. So I think it's important to bring that up uh, as, a, as a potential limitation. Um, and then, uh, you know, an alternative, Zach, would be to just count up simply the number of years of exposure, say, to low generosity regime versus a high generosity regime, rather than using the differential generosity based on the number of kids in the, uh, in the household. Okay, so that's uh, one suggestion. Um, I found myself a little confused. The presentation was a bit uh, more, more clear on some ver definitions uh, as you move through the paper. 
um, uh, for the empirical model, exactly how is poverty measured in the empirical model, likewise with the EITC. Um, your dependent variable for most of your analyses are the pre-tax and transfer um, uh, definition of poverty on the premise that EITC should only affect indirectly through be the behavioral response. And I, I kind of got the sense in the writing of the paper that you thought that that might be relatively small, um, but but um, uh, and maybe I just misunderstood what you were trying to get at. But there was a nice paper by Hillary Hoynes and Patel and the JHR in 2018 that actually finds this behavioral response to be quite large amongst um, single moms. Um, I was a little confused about your figure four, where it seems as though poverty risk is increasing in EITC exposure amongst whites in that figure. Uh, but then in figure five, you find very clear protective effects among whites who aren't exposed to poverty in childhood, interestingly. Um, the other thing, and then I'll wrap up here, is that the work on mechanisms, it's interesting. Um, the early results suggest that there aren't very many differences between blacks and whites on most of the outcomes in the paper. The exception is the employment response of women. And, and my paper with Bradley and Charles, uh, uh, you know, highlights that this is just a simple event study exercise. The dependent variable is, you know, work or not. And this is focusing on the big expansion of the EITC in the, in the 1990s. So this is of women, and you can see a much larger uh, percentage point response amongst black women than white women, women to the EITC in, in the early 90s. So uh, there does seem to be something uh, going on, right, in terms of uh, at that big uh, change in the 90s. Um, and so I encourage you to kind of focus a little bit more on the on the employment stuff. So with that, I'm out of time and I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we are going to open the floor up for questions. So I'm going to see if we have uh, give give a few seconds to see if any questions come in. We don't have any as of yet, but if you're in the audience, um, uh, feel free to ask. And while we're waiting on those people to come in, uh, I it would be great if any of the respondents uh, or not respond any of the um, participants panelists would like to either ask each other a question or respond to your discussion at all so uh, we'll have time for that but you know, if anyone wants to just you know throw out an introductory question while we wait uh feel free um we're still awaiting questions so yeah um and, and i know there were some questions that came in the chat so if the uh, panelists have questions for each other feel free to go ahead and ask those now Maybe I'll jump in and then ask uh, first, if I can just say quickly, thanks so much to, to Jim Ziliak for a, a tremendous set of comments, incredibly useful for us, especially in this developmental stage of the paper. So thanks so much for taking the time and, and for all your thoughts there. And then I want to pose a question to, uh, to Jenny Romick as well. I, I think it's really fascinating work from uh, your team at, at, at UW there. And I was wondering, just to give you a chance to tell a little bit more about some of the ways you and your team might be using this data. So one question I've been interested in, and there's been, uh, of course, lots of work on recently is racial disparities and in access to unemployment insurance benefits, for example, even among uh, individuals who lose their job and should be eligible for the benefits. Uh, of course, a million other questions you could ask using the data. So I just wanted to give you a chance to share a little bit more about some of the ways you and your team might be thinking about using that data and if that's one of the areas you, you might look at. Um, thank, thanks, Zach. Um, and thanks also, I, I will second your thanks to Jim for the, the detailed comments here. Um, I part, part of what we're doing more, more broadly right now is, is looking for more questions um, that would be relevant to the state. Um, and, and you actually gave us a great example that I'm uh, going to write down here. Um, our um, governor about two years ago instituted um, a new cabinet level position. We have a statewide office of equity now. And one of the director's um, priorities is getting um, population specific data. It, we, we, all, we often call it disaggregated data, um, but, but she says, you know, all data is disaggregated, but normally you can only kind of figure out what what white people are doing in it. Um, and, and so we're, we're trying to get full population count data. Um, so that that's that's one thing. Um, 
and, and we're really on kind of a listening talking tour with the, the different state agencies about how this could be helpful. Um, one other example that's come up that's similar to the UI question is um, folks at the Economic Services Division at DSHS are interested in trying to figure out whether there are populations, whether racial, ethnic, or geographic, or a combination thereof, who seem to be SNAP eligible but aren't aren't using SNAP benefits. Um, you know, SNAP has pretty high take up rates, but Jim Jim knows far more than me about the the details of how it's not quite universal. Um, and and that's one priority for the state is trying to figure out how could we better provide access for everyone who needs it, not just the people who are currently providing access. So um, I, I had a question uh, for Christina that actually kind of um, touches on, on, on Keisha's work. Um, and we did a little chat on this, but I'd like to, to bring it forth in the group if that's all right, Stephen. Um, yep. I think an alternate explanation um, rather than thinking about these mechanisms as discrimination, I think you could think about them maybe as, as white privilege, as structural white privilege, and, and how, how it operates through a variety of systems. So um, it, if I could borrow an example from, from Keisha's work on um, kind of wealth and health and um, race, you know, if you are married to a white person in this society, you have kind of structurally greater odds that your spouse will be healthier throughout their life. They're not experiencing kind of the wear and tear. And that may affect your ability to stay in the labor market, or it may affect your need to stay um, in, the, in the labor market as well. Um, I mean, ultimately, discrimination and structural white privilege are both kind of fuzzy, fundamentally unmeasurable ideas. And I think it matters um, which one which one you um, you kind of discuss as, as the the invisible metaphors here. Um, so just just think think about that and and think about whether you could tell some some more mechanism stories. Maybe thinking about um, kind of advantages to to whiteness and the proximity to whiteness. So and just I mean one one more mechanism here, um, and then I'll be quiet. Um, is, is just family wealth that, you know, in midlife, a lot of white people end up inheriting wealth that can allow, allow you to take more risks in the labor market, allow you to invest more in human capital. Um, so, all right. Right. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I, I think in the paper, maybe we could definitely do a better job of indicating that we think that those things matter. In my mind, it was like, we're talking about something that is so multifaceted that to, and not many people are investigating interracial marriage and labor market outcomes. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I see all these areas that are interconnected and all these things that are interconnected and determining which way to move is, is really difficult. So we've made some choices and we've kind of put some things on the side that we're going to deal with later. But I, I 100% agree. I think that both Jonathan and I definitely agree with that. I love the, the idea of the family wealth. That's definitely a factor. A couple of things that I've thought of that play a role are the things that happen after you get married. And so one of the problems with using cross-sectional data and when you're talking about marriage is you don't know when the individual acquired their level of education. Right. So people go back to school and I know lots of personal stories where this has happened. And if you have access to wealth that you or opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise have, you have a different outcome that we're not controlling for and that we really can't control for with cross sectional data. But I think that you're right. We need to do a better job of um, maybe framing that in our introduction. Can I just uh, add real quick, uh, kind of a second to Jenny's suggestion, Christina. So the, my comments kind of related to that, you know, the way you set up the empirical model is, 
you're assuming the returns to the other factors are the same across gender and race. So for example, the returns to education is the same. Uh, and, and there's plenty of evidence to suggest that, that they differ. So one way you could allow that and get at Jenny's is you estimate separate equations for you know, uh, the different groups. And then there's a decomposition, which uh, sometimes referred to as Oaxaca ransom. Uh, and basically you can, when you look at the difference in coefficients, you can have one, one set of the differences reflects nepotism, which is what Jenny is looking for and the other is reflecting discrimination. So you can look at white privilege and uh, uh, disadvantage uh, all in the same decomposition, but you know it requires you to run separate regressions, but it seems like you have ample sample sizes in the ACS to do that, so. So we have had a quiet audience, um, no questions from them, but uh, I don't think the panel has been any less stimulating. Um, I, really fascinating work from everyone. Thank you for taking the time to submit and to present your work. We very much appreciate it. Um, equitable growth, thank you for your contributions. Um, and it's uh, this is what we're doing here is exactly the things that we value, trying to take this research, uh, bring people into conversation, um, push forward policy. So we really, again, we really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, we're gonna wrap the session up, um, but yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you to our audience. Um, and we look forward to connecting soon. All right, take care everyone. All right, thanks. Bye-bye.